What I want to tell you about is some work we've been doing the last couple years where we've been trying to study um, a common genetic variant in a growth factor called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It actually is very similar to what uh, Dr. Insel was talking about, uh, DISC-1, in the sense that this is a genetic mutation in humans. But actually this turns out to be not as rare. It is actually turns out to be a very common human polymorphism, that 20 to 30 percent of the people in this tent actually have this polymorphism. And when it's been studied in, in vitro, what has been found is that there is actually, this polymorphism actually leads to amino acid change in the protein, and actually also when you, they studied in neurons, there's decreased amount of this growth factor that's released from neurons. So this is a key growth factor involved in brain development that seems to have some difficulty getting out if there is an uh, amino acid change from a valine to methionine. So the most direct way would be to actually study it in humans. But when I started my lab a couple of years ago, what I decided to do was go through a different route. So we actually decided to knock this polymorphism into a mouse. Because in a mouse model, you can do things in a much more controlled and systematic manner and actually get at what possibly this would have its in impact on various psychiatric disorders. This growth factor belongs to a very old and famous family of, of growth factors that was first found in 50 years ago. And brain-derived neurotrophic factor turns out to be the major growth factor for, uh, of this family in the brain. And the classic response is that you add it to a neuro nerve cell and the nerve cell blooms. It essentially differentiates and sends out processes. Um, and for the last 20 years, a tremendous amount of work has been done on basic biology of understanding how this affects brain development. It was not until 2003 when Danny Weinberger at NIMH found the first genetic mutation in this gene that actually was found to have abnormalities in humans, where humans who have this actually have a memory deficit in, the, in a very specific region of their brain called the hippocampus, which was mentioned already. Also, what was found afterwards was that there was a remarkable change in the structure of the hippocampus with, with humans who have this, and that, um, so that their hippocampus is actually a little smaller. But what was absolutely not clear is whether or not this was at all involved in psychiatric disorders. These are behavioral phenotypes, anatomical phenotypes. But when people started to study, to do association studies to find whether or not they're related to psychiatric disorders, there was actually a great difficulty in localizing or getting reproducible results from the various studies. So the approach we took was we looked at all these disorders, such as depression, bipolar disorder, and said that there's a common symptom among all these. There, it, it's actually, we thought that there might that within these there's a symptom called anxiety. And this is something that could be readily tested in animals. And so what we did was, did something that was very different in human studies. We could actually, instead of asking the mice what, whether they were anxious or not, we actually put them into stressful situations and, and then just measured uh, unbiasedly what they would do. So a typical experiment would be to put them on an elevated platform and give them a choice between being in a safe, closed arm of an elevated plus maze or in an open, more dangerous arm of an elevated plus maze. And a mouse normally would, a wild type mouse, would spend most of the time it's in the closed arms, but would make forays into to the open arm. Let me just see if this But when we tested the mice that had this human polymorphism, we noticed that there was a significant decrease in the amount of time they spent in the open arms. So what we have been able to use uh, by using this mouse, we've been able to find a new phenotype that is associated with a genetic mutation that was not yet established in humans. But what we can do further than with a mouse is we can actually try to break down the anxiety to its elemental components. And our thoughts were that actually we hypothesized that this anxiety was due to difficulties in learning uh, about cues of fear, of cues of safety versus danger. So that we actually could design experiments to test this directly. And we trained, trained mice to associate a, a, a tone, which is a sort of a neutral cue, with a dangerous um, uh, stimulus such as an electric shock. So, but then what we did is we tricked the mice and then started to play the tone over and over again. And they should actually learn to that the tone that was once dangerous is no longer dangerous. And as you can tell, a wild type mice stops freezing and realizes that after the 30th tone, it is no longer dangerous. Um, but a mouse with this polymorphism can't learn this. I was very lucky at this point to have a very talented cognitive neuroscientist at Cornell who could then take the same task and then translate it into humans. And she performed the same studies in humans.
And she was able to basically, instead of using electric shock, a loud noise to show that if you showed up humans uh, yellow boxes and compared them with loud noises, then what you could do is that you could then play the, show them the yellow box over and over again, about 30 times, and the humans who basically did not have this polymorphism could eventually stop uh, eliciting this physiological response called a galvanic skin response, which is an, a measure of anxiety. But the humans who did not, who had the polymorphism, uh, uh, still couldn't, would always have an anxious response to this yellow box. And, but what's great about this type of translational work is then you can do things that are much more sophisticated in humans. And as Helen Mayberg brought up, what you can do is you can actually um, do functional imaging. And what we could do is she has now been able to identify certain brain regions, such as the amygdala, where, where as she's play, showing the humans the yellow box in a functional scanner, while, uh, while people without the polymorphism are able to tamp down this fear region, humans with this polymorphism continue to have sort of fear responses to a yellow box, which had been previously associated with a dangerous signal. So in conclusion, what I wanted to show you is just sort of what we're trying to do, where we're trying to do parallel studies between mice and humans, where we try to generate hypotheses within the mouse, which can be subsequently tested in humans. And the hope is that once we sort of identify these discrete phenotypes that we could actually try to do, use the mouse in addition to generate hypotheses, but also to try to generate um, novel drug screens to find medications that could possibly be te tested in mice and ultimately translated into humans. I'd just like to thank everyone who in my lab who did the work and all my collaborators. Thank you so much.